Good morning, big dogs, and welcome back to the HQ. We are jumping back into behind the business of fantasy football. We have Mr. Mike Tagliere of the Fantasy Pros. This is a series in which we release every Monday where we're talking about the behind the scenes of fantasy. We're talking about advertising. We're talking about revenue and marketing and a lot of the stuff that we don't get the time to talk about because we're so busy diving into player analysis and teams and coaching and and things like that. So this is a series where we kind of get to expand our mind a little bit, think about things from a, a larger picture in terms of the industry, who is innovating things and My idea for this industry series is to bring on a wide variety of guests so that people out there can get different angles and different points of view from how people became successful within the industry. The last couple of guests I've had on, Matt Kelly of Roto Underworld and Andy Holloway, the fantasy footballers, two great guests, but very, very different paths from uh, the path that Mike took, right? He's probably more of a, a traditional route in the sense of where the industry is at right now or where it had been for the last couple of years. So for a lot of people out there, this might be more valuable to you because there are a lot of people chugging away and writing and blogging and, and trying to diversify their content. And Mike obviously does a very good job of that while staying on top of the industry and putting in the work and, and growing year over year over year. So Mike, welcome to uh, Behind the Business of Fantasy Football. I'm, I'm pumped up to talk to you. I think we got a lot of, a lot of good stuff to, to get off our plate today. Thanks, Nick. I, I appreciate the invite to the show. Uh, I think as Andy talked about, it's like one of those things where we appreciate the time away from talking about player analysis and talking about something else because I tell people, I'm not a piece of meat. Uh, <laughs> in, in reality, I know people follow me for football advice, but uh, to those who tune into this, I appreciate you guys tuning in. And Nick, thanks for asking me on. I, I, I love talking about anything uh, as long as it's human interaction because uh, during the football season, we just don't get enough of it. Yeah, believe it or not, people out there, um, we, we are people behind the scenes and we have other <laughs> passions besides football and fantasy football and sports altogether. Mine, as you have probably been able to tell from the last few interviews, are focused around branding and marketing and, and business and those kind of things. We're going to figure out what inspires Mike today to work so hard and put out the content that he does. So Mike, as someone who is kind of a, a top of the game in terms of fantasy content as a blogger, as a content producer, you are the senior writer, lead analyst for Fantasy Pros, I believe, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so that is obviously where you're at now, but I'm sure there has been so much work that you've had to put in in order to get to where you are right now. Give us a quick background where you came from. Are are you someone that kind of came out of school as like a journalism major, communication sports, like a very set pathway in order to get where you are today? You started writing for a a bunch of different publications. Give us a, a quick breakdown. No, honestly, uh, there's a lot of people that I think gravitate towards me because I'm one of those guys that was just like a blue collar worker. Like I, I was I, I, right out of high school. I actually, I, I, for, I, I passed on college right out of the gate because I wanted to work. And uh, my dad, he had owned a, a furniture business. We built and we delivered office furniture. And uh, I was doing that for years. And then I ultimately, I hurt my back real bad. Uh, I, I fractured a few vertebrae. I blew out a few discs. I had to have a fusion done uh, at a very young age and it laid me up and they told me it was going to be a year recovery. So during that year, I kind of was just sitting back. I had always enjoyed writing, uh, but I never really, I was, I, I, again, I didn't go to school for it. I, I, during the process of working for my dad, I went to, I, I finally got back into school and I went to broadcasting school. Uh, and then when you get out of broadcasting school and you have a child at the age I did, I had a mortgage, I had a wife. It was all these things I found out that starting out as a producer making, you know, 50, 60 bucks a show, it really wasn't going to pay the bills for our family. So I wasn't able to pursue that. So I kind of just went about my business and I kept working for my dad, hurt my back. And when I was laid up, I I did what every, I think every fantasy football player does is they kind of just sit there and they go through the players. I, I wrote down like a paragraph on every single player that I was debating, you know, coming draft season. And uh, my wife looked at me and she's like, why don't you do something with all the writing that you do for this? And I'm like, what am I going to do with it? Because Mm -hmm. at this time, fantasy football wasn't really a big thing, like in terms of like internet presence, uh, podcasts, they were, this is back in 2011, I think. And um, I was like, who wants to read my stuff? You know what I mean? And she's like, well, if you had a website, what would you call it? And I was like, I don't know, tagsfantasyfootball.com. Very and, original. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was just like, I, I never even gave it a, a, a second of thought. And it was just, that was my nickname uh, in high school. So five minutes later, she's handing me her laptop and telling me, hey, I bought you the domain. I want you to just post stuff on there. Maybe it goes somewhere. Maybe it doesn't. She had faith in me before I even thought of doing it for a living. And um, I just started doing that. And, you know, every now and then a few emails would come in and I would respond to them in long form. Uh, people would send me screenshots of their entire league. And uh, it started... I mean, I was doing this for like three years, writing a paragraph on every player. And it was like, I only did like 20 running backs, 30 wide receivers, 10 quarterbacks. It wasn't like massive, but people love the detail is that I not only told them, you know, who they should start, but why they should start them. And um, 
Fantasy Pros, I actually, when I was running my site, I, I emailed the owner, Dave, and asked him if I could become part of this expert competition that they had. And he's like, hey, we're looking for experienced writers. You know, we appreciate the interest. Maybe reach out once your site's a little bit more developed. It's so odd that it kind of went full circle, but he basically he emailed me like two weeks later and said, hey, I went and checked out your site. It's really in depth. We'd actually like to have you part of it. So they had me on for the next year. I, I did it for like three years, three and a half years with like no income at all, just running my own website. And I did well in their expert competition in back-to-back -back years. So Jeff Radcliffe and Mike Clay from PFF, they announced they were hiring some part-time writer. And I was like, okay, I'll do that. I, I applied, I got a part-time job and I was working, I wasn't able to do furniture delivery anymore because I, I just destroyed my back. So I was working uh, for JP Morgan Chase as a private client banker with them. And so while doing that as a, as a full-time career, that was a career job. I was kind of doing football on the side as like, I don't know where it's going to go. You know, they kind of built up with them. I was working part-time for two years. They offered me full-time in season. And it was like, I couldn't do my day job and do that job. But it was, it was at the point where it was like, I had to make a decision. And uh, my wife told me, you're leaving your job. And uh, even though it was like, uh, I, I think it was about a fifth of the money that I was making per year at my other job. Um, to do it, but she felt she's the one who's been pushing me this entire time. I, I made the decision I was going to go full time in season and, and see where it took me, uh, put everything I had into it because I was never able to fully dedicate all my time to it because I had my full time job. Well, I worked my butt off that year and uh, I, I got a full time offer year round from Fantasy Pros at the end of that season. So everything worked out. Um, it was a lot, people you know, they, they see you at the end and they're like, wow, you're doing great work here. But that grind that it takes to get there, if you don't love what you're doing in fantasy football, like if you can't do it 24 seven, it's really not going to be for you because you do have to grind it out every single day. Yeah. Well, one shout out, shout out to your wife, man. That yes. is like, that is really uh, inspiring. Cause I think when most people start to pivot towards a, a non-traditional route, you have a lot of pushback. And for me personally, that was one of the, I, I left my full-time job maybe like three years ago or so. And the first year was probably the most mentally, uh, it was probably the, the toughest thing mentally, you know, just, and it wasn't like I had people that were like, you shouldn't do this. You're not going to succeed. It wasn't yeah. like typical, like hater kind of stuff like that, but it could be very mentally taxing thinking about how people are judging you or thinking about how people not want you to fail, but might think that you might fail or whatever. Right. That seems like it was probably the most important thing right there. Your wife pushing you to do that. Like, would you have been able to muster up the strength to maybe even start the blog or leave your job or whatever, had it not been for her? No, uh, no, I wouldn't have. And I, I thank her for that all the time. And I think anybody that's followed me for a long time knows that I, I attribute a lot of my success to my wife and the fact that she's pushed me because she almost realized what my passion was. And I was always a realist in life. You know, I was one of those guys that said, you know, I understand it's a real thing. Like I wanted to be a statistician and I wanted to be able to look at, like to keep box scores and do all these things. But I was always like, there's only a few people that have those jobs in the world. But she was the one who kept on telling me, if you want something, you'll get it. And, and it was one of those sayings that my dad said growing up. And unfortunately, I lost my dad um, when I was uh, 25 years old. Um, and he had always told me growing up, he's like, you can do anything you put your mind to, like anything. And I'm like, and I was a smart ass kid. And I, I would tell him, dad, if I wanted to be faster than Carl, Lu Carl Lewis, there's no way I could do it. And he's mm -hmm. like, no, if you wanted to, he's like, you'd run up the stairs every single day. You'd go up and down. You'd find a way to do it. He's like, but I'm just trying. It was almost like him just trying to tell me if you really want something, go and get it. And when someone believes in you the way that my wife did me, it's almost like, and it sounds so corny, but it's true is that failure really wasn't an option for me because the last thing I want to do is let her down. And if she believed in me that much, and I knew if I had the time to do it, you know, I, I, I would be able to do it. And the, the craziest part about this, Nick, is that I left out when I, when she had convinced me to leave JP Morgan to, to do it for a living at, you know, losing a whole bunch of money in the process, we found out that she was pregnant when I had to, when I, when I decided, so we were having another baby and I was like, no, no, there's no way I could do this. And she was just finishing up nursing school. And it was like the stars just aligned where she's like, I'm going to get a bump in salary. We'll make it work. We're going to sell our house. We sold our, basically the dream home that we bought uh, because we were both working extremely hard to get what we had. Um, we sold that house downgraded, um, in order to make it work and we did make it work. And, uh, and it really did pay off. And, uh, again, I, I really would not be anywhere, anywhere in this industry without her. Uh, she's still to this day. I mean, she has to deal with everything that I do and, you know, in season, I, I might see her for two hours at night and that's about it. Um, where I I'm trying to do a better job of like, you know, work life and you know, home stuff, uh, balance that, but she understands this is what I do. This is what I have a passion for. And that's why she supports it.
That is, uh, that's really incredible. Um, again, shout out to Ms. Tags. Happy Valentine's Day to her. We're filming this on Friday. So Mike, you're actually my Valentine for the day. So, <laughs> so welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that is, that is awesome. And I want to, I want to pivot this to an avenue that can maybe give people, uh, some more value. Some of the beginners out there that might want to start something, but are nervous that their brother, sister, best friend, uh, significant other, might give them some pushback on it, right? And might say that's the reason that they're not starting or that's the reason why they're scared to kind of go 100% all in on it. And you have a story where you had someone that was supportive, you know, from the start. So not that it made your grind any easier, but in terms of a, you know, a mental thing, it definitely helped push you to work harder at it. For someone maybe that, you know, doesn't have that type of support system for the people close around them, would you, what would you suggest them? Do you have any, any tips? This is really, it's really sad to say it, um, yeah. but it probably can happen. Um, and, and I, I, and it's, and I'm not going to, I'm not mentioning any names, but there's a few guys that I know in the industry that would have really liked to have made it. And they were great writers, but they didn't, they just didn't have the support at home. They didn't have the support to, to dedicate the time needed to do it, to, you know, to bail on dinner, to call off work. <laughs> like I, I was the type Nick where if I had like, if CBS or, or, you know, um, uh, Fox would, they, they'd ask me if I could do a podcast fantasy pros. If they asked that, and, if, and if, when I was doing the part time, it was like if I if they asked me to do a podcast with them and get exposed to an audience that I was never exposed to, I'm gonna take a sick day, I'm gonna take a vacation day, I'm gonna take whatever I have to do to make sure that I I, I make it work. And there's a lot of guys that their significant others don't support that. Uh, there's some, there's women out there in the community now that I'm sure their husbands might some of them might not support it because they think it's just like a pipe dream. My brother, okay, my brother still works for J.P. Morgan as a financial advisor. And he is someone when I was leaving JP Morgan, he, he's like, he basically, he knew I knew my stuff, but he was almost like, Mike, this isn't career savvy. You know, you, you're, this is like kind of, he knew it was a dream, but at the same time, he was just like, I can't believe you're doing this. And now it's funny because we will go and play golf and he's walking around. He's telling me, he's like, I have clients that walk into my office and they know who you are. And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm working with Mike's brother. And I'm like, if that's cool. And he's just like, no, he's like, I, I owe you an apology. He's like, I'm sorry that I ever doubted the fact that you can make it work. And he's like, it just seemed like it was like one of those dream scenarios. And, and to be honest, it is, it, it still is a dream scenario, but I, I do know everything it takes. And one of those things that it does take and it, it's paramount. It's that you need the support at home and there is no way you have to choose your career. And it's sometimes, like I said, it's a problem for me where it's like choosing work over family and I don't want to do that, but there, there's, there's parts of me that know there's someone else out there that's me, you know, coming up in the industry that, that's trying to take what I have. And I don't ever want to lose that. I love what I do. I, don't, I, I used to count down the days till I turned 55 so I could retire. I always wanted to retire at 55. <laughs> now I don't even think about it. I don't care because I love what I do. I do work hard at it. Um, the, the schedule in season is pretty grueling, but when you love what you do, I'm not going to say that you don't work a day in your life. You do, but you make sacrifices is what you do in order to do what you love. And um, I'm willing to make those. And that's obviously, you know, why I'm still doing it. I'd agree with your point that, you know, it probably won't work. I will say it's definitely not black and white. I think, you know, if, if you're with someone, you're, you're probably with them for the right reasons to start with. And if you sit down and have a simple converse, conversation with them, bring out your true authentic feelings and you know where you want to go what your passion is behind if it's real to you if you really feel that way about something you'll be able to express that to the other person and they'll be able to feel it back to you i think if they don't understand it at that point then maybe there needs to be some kind of bigger conversation about the whole picture there but yeah i mean there needs to be some kind of support system like i have my mom who has never ever doubted anything i've done so far up to this you know she never pushed me to do anything she never made me do something i didn't want to do or vice versa but she was always like you know work work very hard you'll always have my support for what you want to do creatively or or work wise or whatever because i believe in you and that like you you don't realize it especially at a younger age how much that really impacts your mindset it kind of becomes like the norm when i hear it from my mom every day every week every month every year i'm like okay whatever you know my mom believes in me but as I get older, I'm like, maybe I would never have pushed myself to these certain limits had I not had someone there supporting me in the way that she did. So I think, like you said, it's extremely important to have that support system there. And it doesn't have to be from your mom. It doesn't have to be from your significant other. But there does have to be people in your life that keep you mentally stable and, and do support you and push you because you're going to get down at times. Like you said, in this industry, I mean, the grind is, is, is crazy, crazy, crazy. And you can't 
support yourself only. You need other people that kind of back you up and let you know that what you're doing is, is worth it or what you're doing you're good at and you should continue to do so. So people starting out there have honest conversations with the people around you. And if you're serious about it, they'll take you seriously. That's the way I look at it. Yep. And then there's people out there that, that view it as a hobby. And if you view it as a hobby, it's going to continue to be that. Uh, but it, there, there comes a point where you have to decide, what am I doing with this? Am I, am I, am I putting my time towards this? Um, like, am I working towards something? Do you want to do it for a full, for full time? And that's the thing is there's, there's some guys like you got, you had just had Matt on the show. Matt doesn't take himself too seriously. I am like the opposite of Matt, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Like Matt and I talk and it, Matt and I get along very well, but in terms of like how I view this, I, I view this as a business. I view it at, like, like my Twitter, I treat it as a business. I don't tweet out personal things because it's like, you know, I think people get into that. It's like, you don't bring that stuff into your business. And, uh, I've always treated it that way. You have to have the right mindset. If you, if you really want to do it for a living, you have to put in the work and you have to treat it like a business. You can't treat it like a hobby anymore. And I, I tell people now, I'm like, at some point, you have to say that I am an analyst first, player second, because there's some people that still put the player first because you know, they may be a DFS tout and they refuse to give away some of the, the information that they, they don't want to because they want to use it for their own personal gain in their own, in their own tournaments or, or contests. Whereas me, if I'm doing my job well and people are making money because of me, I'm going to continue to do my job and that's all I care about. It's funny that you, that you say that. You don't necessarily bring your personal stuff onto your Twitter. You, keep it, you, you treat it like a business. And when you look at the people in the business, you say or analyst first, player second, right? Yep. When I think about it, I think about just in terms of no matter what job you have, no matter what industry you are, I think you're a marketer first, job second, right? Marketer first, fantasy analyst second, mm -hmm. marketer first, fucking plumber <laughs> second, you know, along those lines. That's the way I yeah. think of the world today because marketing in a sense is you have your message, you have the value that you bring to your audience and marketing is figuring out where you need to deliver that message, right? And if you can't get in front of the eyeballs, then your, your message as good as it could be, you might be the best analyst in the entire world, but if you don't know how to market yourself first, you're going to fall short because no one's going to see that. No one's going to share your stuff. No one's going to engage with your stuff, right? So I think of it from marketer first, analyst second. So I also think of it that you said, you know, you don't really bring your personal stuff into your business stuff. I, on the flip side, think, let's talk about personal branding here because yeah. You work for a big company, right? Fantasy yep. Pros. You also have a very big personal brand, right? So you have leverage in, in the name itself. Don't you think that your personal brand is built through who you are as a person, like authenticity? That's the thing that I kind of struggle with, right? Is that, you know, my daughter, <laughs> she's 17 now. And uh, she tries to teach me about basically the social media, the ways in. And there's guys in the industry, like Joel Holka is a guy that I, I talk to an awful lot. And yep. uh, he's really on top of this stuff where he does such a good job of, of getting on every single platform and trying to make it work where to me, it's almost like fantasy pros. I've almost relied on them to do that for me. And they do a good job. They, they, they really do. Uh, the guys on the team, there are so many guys that, that put so much work into it. Like I cannot understate what, what everything that they do and how good it makes our work look and how they get it out there to the masses. Because me, I've always been the guy that focuses on the work, right? It's because I feel like if I were to sit down, Nick, and, and just go through Twitter and try and answer everybody's questions, I would never get off Twitter for the day. Right. I, I legitimately would not be able to get away from it. And if, and if I'm doing that all day and answering Instagram and answering TikTok's apparently a thing, LinkedIn, all these, I can't keep up with all of them, right? But mm -hmm. If I'm doing that, then I'm basically I'm not able to do what got me here in the first place. And that's basically learn about the game of football, teach people the things that they don't know. And yes, there is a fine line though. You have to show personality because there's a lot of guys out there that I know are extremely smart. They're, they're, they're X's and O's, their percentages in terms of schemes and, and what people do with certain personnel in the field. But if you sound like a robot to people, it's going to be boring and you have to insert personality at some point. And that's why to me, podcasts are my favorite avenue uh, to do, to be, to be able to deliver content because writing people could take it in different ways. You could, when you read something, everybody reads it differently in a podcast. You can, you can actually show your personality a little bit while delivering that information, doing it on the spot. But I do struggle with it a little bit in terms of like, even our social media guy. Now he's trying to get me to push a little bit more in terms of like showing my personality. He's like, you do have a brand. And I'm, I'm like, well, my brand's all about football. And it's like, he's trying to get me to push out and say, understand, let your, let your personality shine. Talk about things outside of football. Uh, show those things, you know, because people do want to hear about them. And I understand it because, you know, when I follow my favorite, whoever I, I watch or whatever, a band or whatever, I love seeing the off the stage stuff because just because I like the band's music doesn't mean I don't want to see who they are off the stage because I think that's one of those things that helps you identify and helps you like them more as a person because if you like them as a person, you're going to love them even more as an analyst. So 
it's a really fine line for me about separating the work and personality, but at the same time, I understand the importance of it. It's just one of those things that I continually try and get better with. Yeah, I, I think you should. I think you should veer more towards the showing more, being a little bit more authentic or transparent. Not saying you're not. There's a difference yeah. between, you know, like lying and being completely like authentic and transparent with it. And obviously you're not on on your shows or anything like lying about stuff. It just let yourself go is the way I look at it. Cause I think of it from a, a depth versus with thing. Like, yes, yeah. if you know, if, if you're just like a nice person and you go along your show, you don't really aggravate people. Of course, you're going to start to build some width because you're not upsetting anybody. So it's get larger and larger, but the depth is where I find the most importance when it comes to your engagement, when it comes to your audience, when it comes to your customers, anything like that. And I think that only comes from being very relatable and kind of letting that side out of you. And I kind of want to bring this up because I, th I thought it would be a good example. I got an email this morning. This was from two hours ago from someone in my audience. He says, Hey, Nick, I like your show. And this is one person's feedback. I work from home and I listen to YouTube while I work and sometimes through a Bluetooth speaker while running household making dinner or whatever I have to switch off your videos to something else if my kids are around because of the cursing you do a lot of hard work and I don't see a world where you'll be less successful if you keep it family friendly ish you know in mm -hmm. fact I see you taking it to another level but again just one person's whatever thoughts and this is something that if you come from my audience, if you come onto my videos, you'll hear me curse all the time. And it's not, I don't mm -hmm. do it as a razz. I don't do it to like try to be cool or make that my personality. It's just like, if you, talk, you. if you talk to me in real life, I'll, yeah, I, I curse way too often. It's not something I'm proud <laughs> of, but it's just who I am. And I'm not going to fight against that. Like I'll deliver my message the way it is. Cause that comes off authentically. And I told him that I was like, I appreciate, you know, the feedback from you. Unfortunately, like that's just who I am. That's how I'm going to deliver it. Like, I hope you'll stay with us and, and stay for the value or the entertainment or however, whatever you find good about the show. But that's just me. So I feel like even just being on a personal level that way, and I'm not saying everyone has to go out and curse, but like, you know, the way you are showing who you are as a person makes it a lot more relatable and you get that depth within your audience. So my personal opinion, the way personal brands are built nowadays is through being more transparent because it, it's something over the last like five years that has become less and less easy to see because people are so like fake for Instagram and these things that once you do see someone that you're like, wow, this dude is like really open about stuff. You know, I really connect with this guy. And that's when you start building those like really deep relationships. And that's, that's something with me. It's like when I let someone in and, and like, I do trust them. I let them in fully, like completely. It's not like, uh, mm -hmm. it's not like I'm going to uh, like half ass do it. And I'm not someone who swears very often. Um, like our podcast is family friendly. We know we have a lot of people that like, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, teenagers that listen. And part of the reason that I don't very often is just because I don't at home just because I, again, I have I mean, a 17 it's, it's year old daughter. Yeah, it's not really, yeah, I, I have fine. her, I have three year old son. It's like, those are things you need to watch. It's not to say I don't swear. I do. And there's probably going to, there's times in the podcast where they go back and they edit it where I said something that I'm like, we should probably take that out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do, I can, I can a hundred percent appreciate people like yourselves that, that build your brand while being yourself. And, and like, even if it may not appeal to the mainstream in terms of like mainstream, you can't turn on TV right now and, and watch someone cuss, you know, over and over. Right. But at the same time, if you watch like, this is, a, this is pretty funny. I was like legitimately in the background. I'll put on like non-football stuff while I'm working. Mm -hmm. And I just got into the show Hot Ones. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Me and my, my best friend did a, a reenactment of Hot Ones. There's a video on my channel like two years ago. Yeah. I love and that show. And that's the thing yeah. is like, I'm watching people on there and I'm like thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, Charlize Theron was, was on one of them and she's mm -hmm. cussing nonstop. And I'm like, wow, I didn't really see her as this type of person, but it's, it, she was real. And that's basically, I think what people want. It's just a different setting is all. Well, so you have to well, be mindful. Seeing yeah, yeah, well, you're seeing, like I said, like the last five years has been a huge transition, especially in media, where people don't want fakeness anymore. They don't want yeah. political correctness. They don't want everything spruced up and looking perfect and pretty. And that's why like TV is slowly dying, you know, and that's yeah. like YouTube, like your podcast is the new popular radio show and a YouTube channel is the new popular TV show. And that's why you're seeing like these shows on YouTube. Like there's still a lot of people that don't take it seriously because the older generation will always have in the back of their mind that like TV is TV, no matter what you say about YouTube and, you know, even like TikTok, it's not something that I'm heavily in, but I understand that that's where the eyeballs are. That's where the audience is. So it's real as much as you don't want it to be real. I mean, it's there. It's real. You can't, can't fake that. And the authenticity on those platforms is what's making a lot of the creators nowadays separate themselves from other people. Yeah, no. <laughs> and again, so having a 17 year old, old daughter helps me understand what kids mm -hmm. are into. It doesn't mean that I necessarily understand it, but no, I, I think you make a really good point. There are some things that I feel strongly enough about that I do share my opinion on. And it's always one of those things where you know that you're going to divide people with, with some strong opinions. And some things you have to just say, you know what, I'm willing to stand up for it. Like, 
you know, when the whole Ray Rice thing happened, when it, this whole Antonio Brown thing in front of his kids, what he's doing, I, I was willing to stand up and say, I'm screw this guy. I'm done with him. Like, I don't really care what you think. And I've had people like legitimately call me racist because I, I, st I stood up against people that Welcome are doing to the these internet. things. Yeah. yeah. And it's, that's the thing is we can't accept that. There, there was part of me, like when you start growing in the industry and you start seeing more and more of that stuff, you can't help but think like, oh my God, what happened? You know, did, the, did I just turn into someone that I didn't want to be? And my wife reminds me all the time. She says that, just because the news is saying something, just because Twitter is saying something, it does not mean that that's what the masses think. You just see it directed in a certain way and people can make it seem like it's the norm when it's really not. I, I remind her all the time that I'm like, racism, that's like the number one thing in terms of like what drives me bananas when people say something about that. And we're led to believe that it's, it's a huge problem. And I do believe it's a huge problem, but my wife also thinks that she thinks that people are better than what we're portrayed as. She's like, I don't think that, I think there's less bad eggs than there are good less bad eggs. Yeah. But she's trying to basically just saying that we can't direct all of our energy to the negative stuff that's coming in. Let some of the positive shine through because it's the negative things that we'll read or we'll watch and we'll remember rather than the positive things. So it's almost like me changing your mind frame and how you view things and what to block out and what to, and that's what makes it difficult when you have a platform is to stand up for something, you know, you're going to be divided and you know, you're going to see those negative comments, but are there things that I feel strongly enough to about to do that about? Yes, it's just figuring out what that line is where you draw the line and you say, okay, this isn't important for me to comment on. You know what yeah, I, mean? I, I, think, I think how you deliver it makes a big difference too. Like you do a great job of this in terms of fantasy football stuff. You deliver your point, right? You deliver the ultimate point that you're making. The X running back is going to be a top seven running back this year, followed by X, Y, Z. Why? You know, the breakdown, the reasoning, the logic behind it. When you do it with normal talking points in everyday life, whether it has to do with politics or racism or whatever, as long as you share your point of view and you're a reasonable person and you have logic behind, you know, your take on it, I think 99% of people will be like, okay, maybe I disagree, but I respect your opinion. The people yeah. that do stand out, like you said, are the 1%, 2% of people that aren't reasonable people to begin with, right? You're not, that's not someone that you want to hang out with in real life. That's not someone that I even want in my audience. So if they're pissed at me for saying some shit like that, that I really believe in, then right. I don't care. Like they're not people that I want to interact <laughs> with on a, on a normal basis, you know? That makes sense. I don't know. The, the internet's in a, in a funky state, yes. but again, it is what it is and you kind of have to adapt to it. <sighs> we talked about how much work that you put in. And in my opinion, you and maybe Evan Silva, and I'm sure there are a few others out there are up to that level in terms of the volume that you put out for work. And this was something that I talked about on these videos before, but it's something that I dealt with this year to a degree that I've never dealt with before. And it was the burnout, especially during the in-season stuff. Now you put out a, a tremendous amount of content. And like you said, you have the fantasy pros team behind you that helps you in terms of a lot of the stuff that maybe someone, you know, that primarily does through YouTube. Like I do a lot of my video editing and stuff like that, which is time consuming. I'm sure you have people that you outsource or at, on the team that do that stuff for you, but you still put out a ridiculous amount of volume in terms of like your written stuff. You do your primer every week, which is literally a paragraph about, every single player that's playing that week in fantasy and you do it week over week. Same thing, you know, Evan Silva has his matchup column. So for guys like you, I think about that and I like, you couldn't pay me. Someone could offer me a million dollar salary. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not doing that because for me personally, that's, that wouldn't, that would lead to a ridiculous amount of unhappiness for me. So when we talk about how the grind in season is real, like what is your level of burnout when you get, you know, even to like week four or five, and I know you love it obviously. And I love yeah. the content that we make as well, but like, there, there comes a point where, you know, too much is, is too much, right? Yeah, no, it, there is a burnout phase that you have to, to push through. And it's funny you brought up Evan because like this is like the behind the scenes show, right? So uh, when I started doing the primer, uh, there were some people out there that basically suggested it was a copycat off Evan's uh, matchup column. And it was never meant to be that. He, Evan was an inspiration. Evan was mm -hmm. a friend uh, that I hung out with outside of football stuff. Like we hung out. Uh, he knows my family. And uh, I, I heard that. And so I actually called him and I said, Evan, I wanted to talk to you and make sure you're not mad at me about this or anything. He's like, no, dude, he's like, I'm not mad. <laughs> he's like, I just want you to know. He's like, this is going to take years off your life. Like, understand that. Like, because it is a grind. And um, he's like, when people ask me if I was mad about it, he's like, no, he's like, Tex is just a grinder. Like, that's what he is. And he knows that I love to do this and he loves to do it. And it doesn't mean you can't read both columns. You know what I mean? It's, 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 it's laid out differently. This is basically what I did back when I did my own website. Uh, I, I'm just able to do it on a grander scheme and I'm given the time to do the whole, you know, every player from every game. And it turns out to about 30 to 35,000 words a week. And people are like, how much Jeez. is that really? And I'm like, well, an average novel is 80,000 words. So I'm writing half a novel every week. And 
so when you say week four or five, I, I laughed a little bit inside because I know that's when bye weeks start. And, and for people that don't know, uh, bye we weeks <laughs> to me, it's almost like if you're at work Monday through Friday and you have your nine to five job, imagine going into work on Friday and your boss saying, you know what? You go ahead and you go home at noon today. You'd be like, what? Jackpot. Well, that's how I feel when bye weeks are here. When there's two teams, when there's four <laughs> teams, funny. when there's six teams, it's like the best because every game on average, it takes me about three hours uh, to write and research every single game. Mm -hmm. So when there's 16 games in the slate, it's like 48 hours of my time is dedicated only to the primer. And then on top of that, we have, you know, four or five podcasts that we're doing a week. We're doing some video stuff. We're doing, I'm doing two other articles. So it's like, it's a whirlwind and those bye weeks are phenomenal. It's when those bye weeks end, that's when the grind for me really kicks in where it's like, you get to like week 12 and you're just like whoo this is the tough part week 13 oh week 14 it's like the playoffs are here it's almost like i need to regain focus because i'm like people right. in playoffs they need me to be focused on this and that's when things like start getting easier again but at the end of the year it's funny because fantasy pros they asked they actually asked me this year they're like do you want to do a week 17 primer i was like no no that, <laughs> that's christmas week i spend that time with family and um I'll, I'll do rankings and all that stuff but uh week 17 absolutely not guys if you play fantasy championships in week 17 stop stop it uh just yeah. play dfs that week you'll be much happier uh but yeah the the grind the burnout that's a real thing. And that's why I say that if you don't really love what you do, uh, you're never going to be able to do it. I've had friends, you know, that they know where I'm at in the industry and they say, all right, what do I have to do to get started? And I tell them, I'm like, you don't have a, a platform just yet, but here, just do this for yourself. Sit down every day and write a thousand words on a player, on a subject that you want to know about anything. Right. And they get to the, like the, the second week and they're like, what do I write about? I'm like, that's part of the challenge you have to do, you know, while being in this industry and, and figuring out what it is that people want to know what's worth it. My biggest issue in season with the primer is getting to the point where I don't lose the mass reader. Like, uh, you almost, you, you want to keep evolving as an analyst. You want to keep introducing new stats and, 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 and new metrics that are going to, you know, help you formulate an opinion. But at the same time, again, as I mentioned earlier, if you start getting that way and you start mentioning too many stats and off the wall things, you're going to lose people because it gets almost too, I don't want to say nerdy for them, but it kind of does in, in a way that they can't understand it. The challenge to writing is challenging yourself to get better as a writer, but at the same time, being able to get you know 95% of your audience able to relate on every level, a beginner fantasy player, uh, an intermediate one, and then also like the advanced, the guys that, that want to know the, the wide receiver cornerback matchups, they want to know for DFS purposes. So there's a grind, there's a burnout, but Nick, the biggest issue for me in season, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure a lot, I don't think anybody ever talks about it, but is, is actually weight gain. Um, like I got into great shape before, before last season, I got down to like, I was in the best shape I've been into in 10 plus, ever since my back surgery, got in great shape. And then the season came and I gained over like 15 pounds in season. So now it's like trying to get back into the gym because I don't, I don't get to go to the gym in season. Like my schedule is just so packed that I basically, I'm lucky if I get there once or twice a week in season, and that's just not going to do it at my age. Uh, you're sitting in front of a computer, you're not getting any exercise. So like those, that's like the biggest um, struggle for me. And I know there's some guys that say, if, if I didn't write the primer, I'd probably have more time to do those things. But one of the reasons I want to write the primer is because I know it's, it's something that I wanted as a consumer, like I, is there nothing within your content schedule throughout the week that you can give off? Like, is this a, is this more you focus? Like I want to do these eight pieces of content or is this like fantasy pros? Like you're contractually obligated to put out this many pieces, you know, and you don't have the time to do it. Like where, where is it? I feel like this is something you should right. figure out because a lot of people look at the physical side of doing this, like working 60 hours a week or putting in the insane amount of work you do on the primer, but yep. they don't think of the mental side. And that's equally, if not more important, and those kind of things, like the reason I left my job in the first place is because I wanted to be able to create, not to sound cliche, but a lifestyle around how I wanted to live. So I yep. kind of tried to build my work around that. And, you know, health and, and going to the gym is definitely a top priority of mine. So when people look at it, like when they put that stuff secondary, it needs not to be there. Like it, people need to kind of flip the script on the way they think about things. So like where, if you were to throw the gym back in twice a week or something, two extra hours, two and a half extra hours, where do you think you'd be able to pull back on? So that's the thing. It is definitely a me problem because fantasy pros after the first year, they saw like I got to the end of the season, it was just burnt out. And uh, they asked me like, do you want to do you want to spread out the primer? Do you want to do it anymore? And I was like, I do want to do it. I mean, it's, it's a grind. And they're like, do you want us to split it up? Maybe we give half to the other featured writers. And I was like, 
I don't think it'd be the same because you're not getting the, the opinion and like the way it works. And it's all, it all comes back to that mindset of saying, if you want something right, you do it yourself, right? I, I was always the type to never say no to something. And uh, I kept on taking on things, taking on things. And I, I reached a, a point where I had to figure out how to spend more family time, uh, how to get my work done, the, the work that I really, really wanted to do. And I, I don't ever want to stop the primer. And I still have people ask me about it. Are you going to stop? Because I'm sure it, it takes up and it does. But I don't want to stop it because I feel like, you know, you make yourself invaluable in terms of like, can anybody do what I'm doing? No, I don't believe that anybody can. I believe it takes a certain amount of, of energy, of, of willpower, of all those things, of, of sacrifice to, to get there. So I, I keep doing them. Is there things I can give up? I don't know because the demand is there. You know, you talked about it being out there. The, the biggest thing in terms of like, you know, connecting with your audience is being out there for them, being able to answer things. So doing live streams, doing podcasts, doing uh, rankings, you know, answering a few questions on social media where you can here and there. This year, actually, I, 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 I did much better this year. And it's like, I'm learning because this is now, this is going to be my fourth year going into full time, like with fantasy pros. I'm learning what to do with my schedule. So during the NFL season, in season now, I actually wake up at like 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, instead of like waking up at 6.30 or 7, because it gives me an extra hour and a half that I can cut off at the end of the day where I can right. go and spend the time with family. I did a lot better time. I did a lot better job this year spending time with family at night where it's like I was always working uh, the past couple of years. But now it's like trying to figure out that gym schedule and how to be, I mean, I do intermittent fasting throughout the season, okay. but it's still, it doesn't help because I, again, I'm sitting on my butt. There are days where legitimately, if you look at your iWatch, I'm not kidding. There was a Sunday where I did my live stream. I, did, I watched all the games. I'm writing things and podcasting. I swear to you, I took like 810 steps that day. That should not happen as a human being. It's not right, right? So that's what I'm saying. You gain the weight. And it's like now getting back into the gym. And But I'm the type though, Nick, where my wife knows it too. And I know it, but I, I struggle with it. Even if I have nothing like on my schedule to do with fantasy pros. Okay. Even if I like, let's say I got my art. So I have my mock draft, my mock draft article that's going up on Monday. I have that done. I could stop working now because I'm like, I have the article done. I can work on the article I have next, you know, blah, blah on Monday, but I'm not, I, I'm sitting at my computer today and I'm going through the stuff that doesn't show in articles in terms of like going through data collection and going through the things that make me able to talk about things. Cause like when I go to podcast, when people show me, uh, send me show sheets, I don't look at them because I don't want to sound scripted. I hate sounding scripted when I talk about things. So my goal was always when I hop on a podcast, I could talk about any player, any coach, anything you want to talk about, I'm, I'm there to talk about. So it's like the stuff that I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be working on football stuff regardless, even though I'm done with the mock draft, I'm working on stuff that is going to be released in July or August, just because I want to do it. And I'm curious about the information that I'm going to find from it. Yeah. I, I feel like when I'm in my zone too, mid summer or something if I go on someone else's podcast I don't need to see the show sheet either because you've just mm -hmm. been you know like grinding away at the numbers for so long that you don't need that other stuff and yeah as soon as you start diving into everything and trying to make it so nice yeah. and right down an avenue you start to sound scripted but I wanted to circle back on something when I was talking about the mental side of it energy and stuff and you said you you don't think a lot of people can I guess display the type of energy that you have in order to produce the amount of work that you do and I think that's probably correct but I think my question would be, say your, your output is at like an eight and a half right now, which is very good. My question yeah. is like, if you pulled back on the volume from somewhere and you put it into elsewhere, right? Whether it's the gym or it's more leisure time, it's going to the movies once a week or something. Yeah. Would that actually increase your output over here? To, even though it's less time, would it be maybe more efficient? And that's the way I look at it. I think everything is kind of a, a full circle when it comes to energy. I think what you're doing physically and mentally and work and life and relationships and all those things are, are one sphere. It's one thing that they all kind of feed into each other. So that's the way I look at it when I'm thinking about substituting one thing for another. It's not like, okay, I'm going to pull back my work here so that I could put more work in here. It's like, I'm going to pull back there so that I can put it into something I enjoy so that the other work that I have left is more enjoyable or I do better, I'm more efficient at it. Is that something you've ever like kind of considered? It's a learning experience going through uh, doing this full time and doing the work that the, the type of article I do uh, with the primer, just because yes, I, I can dial it back. And, I, and they tell me, they're like, you don't have to write as long of paragraphs because sometimes they get lengthy. And I know that I'm, I'm like a, I'm a talking head. I could talk to myself on paper where it just goes. And I feel like the need to explain what I'm, I'm doing. I'm than the just, same way. Like I'm, I play devil's advocate on myself. Yeah. I'm like, but what if someone says this? So yes. I need to write a new paragraph. I'm, I'm the same way. I get it for sure. Yes. And so you just, you, you, and sometimes it might come off as rambling, but at the same time, I haven't, I've never had someone complain about how much information I'm giving them. Right. Uh, it's more about like, can I be more efficient with how I'm delivering the information? 
maybe. Um, and that's one of those things where it's a learning experience with me. I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at organizing things throughout the week because everything that goes into the primer, there's like, I have, <laughs> I probably have like eight spreadsheets open at once. Like in terms of like, I have a three monitor setup, so I want like six. If there's a way, anybody that knows how to, to create six monitor setup on windows, like I'm sure there, there's someone out there in the audience right now that knows how to do it. I'm sure. Yes. Please reach out to me and tell me how to do it because like, that's part of the reason I actually don't have a standing desk because it can't raise my monitor. It's just too heavy with the stand. Makes Otherwise sense. I would have one those standing desks to be a little bit more health uh, conscious about it. It's one of those things I'm learning. I'm getting there. I got better with the family time this year uh, in terms of like figuring out what I had to do. And I think I'm going to continue to learn as the years go on. But I know I, I, I just really need to kick things in high gear in the off season to kind of make up for all the lost time. That, that's the problem. It's like, you always think there's a, a light at the end of the tunnel yeah. there. You're like, okay, week 17 hits. I'm good to like relax and that will, that will recharge <laughs> me for the season. That, yeah, when I got to, as far as I'm concerned, football ended the last Monday night football at midnight on week 16. Right. And I was like, I'm done. I'm done with football for a while. And I, uh, I went on a little vacation. I was gone for about three weeks or whatever. I hopped around the country That's and awesome. that was what I, uh, I needed to, to recharge. And now I'm back and I'm, I'm ready to go. But like, I will hit a point probably within the next month or two where I'm fired again. And I'll realize, you know, like you said, it's a learning experience year over year. You know, it, it, our, our industry is funny because it's so seasonal yeah. that different parts of the, of the year. And this is with, I guess, with any industry, but ours in particular, you hit certain months of the year where you know what to expect, like yep. mentally, you know what to expect energy wise. So you can, you know, as you get more acclimated to what's going on in the industry, like you can kind of adjust for that. And that's something that I've definitely been learning on, but I've, I've been pivoting more towards really focusing on on, uh, on the mental side of, of things because it's the burnout is kind of unlike anything that I've done work-wise um, outside of this industry. No, it's crazy when you have to think about all that stuff in terms of planning and weddings. I had a friend that he did his wedding on a, on a Friday because he knew I wouldn't be able to come and stay and hang out Saturday night um, because I had to work Sunday morning. So it's like friend. those things that, yeah, no, for sure. It, like he had me standing up and I, I, I do appreciate it. Like those, those are the types of things that do definitely go noticed. And I have, I have some friends that are like, Oh, you do have a dream job. What are you complaining about? And then I have other friends that they understand. They're like, you couldn't do me. I, I couldn't do your job if you paid me enough. They said that it just, it requires a lot of a will. And that's the thing people, we get done with the NFL season. The Super Bowl happens. I dropped my son off at a preschool and they're like, Oh, it's your slow season now. Right. And I'm like, Nope. Not exactly, um, because I don't watch college football in season. We just don't have enough time in a week for me right. to grind out that. Once the NFL season ends, I have to now. Like my job now is going through and watching countless hours of, of uh, prospects. So I watch at least two or three games from every prospect. More on those that are going to be in dynasty rankings and all that. Um, I do that. Free agency <laughs> comes, and it's like you're going to need articles on free agency and the landing spots and what it means for everybody. And then it's like the the draft is at the end of April, so you're going to have mock drafts leading up to that time. In that, the draft, that's when the slow season starts for me. That's when it's like, Mike, take a breath. If you want to go play golf a couple times a week, you could do that. If you want to work on something that, that you've been dying to do, which I have, you could do that. Um, if you want to spend time with family, go on vacations, that's the time to do that. So it's like May, uh, May and June are the two months where that's, that's the rewarding time. That's the time where I need to take to like legitimately just like recharge everything. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested – in the dynamic of, of working at a company like Fantasy Pros, you know, I've I've had a few people on this this series before, like uh, James Coe when he worked at NFL Network and Brad Evans of Yahoo started to kind of put the pieces together of like working at a bigger corporation and what it's like. But Fantasy Pros is like specific, you know, they, he, Yahoo and NFL, they have so many different departments that maybe fantasy is not really their main concern. Fantasy Pros you know, if you go to their website right now, it's, it's, it's very much just like content focused. I don't even yep. know if there was a, uh, an about page per se. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out, like, can you explain to me as a company, fantasy pros, maybe what their, their overall goal is like, or, or their mission or something? Yeah. So the mission in, in, the, in the first place when they started was the, the larger the sample size, the better the results, because no matter what, you know, you're going to have people with differing opinions. You're going to have people that are right, that are wrong. Uh, you're going to have it. Analysts, if they are right 60% of the time or more, they're doing better than, than most. You know, yep. I, I think the, the most average or the most, uh, the highest rated analyst was like a 63% uh, uh, rate. So it's like, you know, you're talking minimal percentage points, but the idea is that when you can get a consensus of all these analysts in one place and merge them into one, you should be more accurate. But the, when they started it, the idea was to make fantasy analysts accountable and um, holding them to a standard saying, if you're putting out advice, let's see how good your advice is. And there's been kind of, there, there was a pushback a little bit 
just from people that maybe like they were doing a TV show, right, on, on Sunday morning and they weren't able to adjust their rankings um, because they were on that show. And that's perfectly understandable. I get that. That's going to affect your, your mm -hmm. accuracy. However, if you're an advice giver, that's the advice you're giving to people. And if that's all they're going off of, that's a problem, right? So yeah. the idea is to track those analysts, see who's the most accurate, up to date every single week, and then give them like an award for it. And we actually give out awards and they get publicity through it. And um, Fantasy Pros recognizes those and they build followings. Like me, I would have never got my job at PFF. That's the thing that people don't re realize is that even if Fantasy Pros didn't pay me as an analyst back then, I was just ranking on their site and doing free work, as some people have called it for them. I was getting recognition, like in terms of like, I finished top six twice in that, in that competition. It was like over a hundred people. And that's why PFF hired me. So I have, I don't really care if I didn't make money through fantasy pros. It was all mm -hmm. about the recognition and building, you know, my following. I was building a following on Twitter and um, that stuff is invaluable. Jumping on a podcast to, to, to reach a new audience. That's invaluable. You know what I mean? Like I, I, it still drives me nuts to this day. And if you're listening to this show and you want to be a fantasy analyst, if someone asks you to be on their podcast and not to say that you should prioritize them, you kind of have to, it's like when, when, you, when, you, when you're so busy, you have to prioritize them. But when you get a big podcast that you know, a lot of people listen to, if they ask you on a podcast, you don't turn them down. You find a way to make it work. You, you like you say, you know what? I have work, but I'm going to, I'm going to make it work. I, I had to, I took personal days. I took vacation days. I took sick days, whatever I, if I went, if I had to sit in my car at lunch and take a phone call to do a podcast, I would do it. Dude, um, I, uh, the, the interview I did with Brad Evans, one of my favorite ones I'll ever do on this series. I Brad's was the best, you know, I, I, yeah. And this was, uh, maybe it might not have even been last summer. I think it was two summers ago. So my audience was even smaller and there was no reason for him to give me the time of day, but I had tweeted at him. He's one of my favorite analysts growing up. He was someone I was inspired by. I tweeted at him like nonstop for weeks and he kept saying like, Oh, next week I'm good. Next week I'm good or whatever. Finally, he tweeted me back. He's like, I'm good this upcoming Tuesday. And I was like, okay, like I'm in. Right. And I oh, realized wow. afterwards that I was going to be in Mexico that week with my friends. We had rented a, you know, an all inclusive resort or whatever. Awesome. I was like, we're going to make this work. So I did that interview. I had two margaritas in hand. I did that interview from the hotel room in, uh, in, in Cancun, in yep. Mexico. That was like one of my favorite things. And I'll always look back on that. People making excuses not to show up to places. I'm like, just, just get it done. Stop, stop blaming shit. If you want it to happen, you'll make it happen. It's yes. really, it's really that simple. Priorities, um, man. That's what it's yeah. about. I put this as number one priority and that's, I wanted it. I went and got it. So going back to the fantasy pro. So that's interesting. So they actually, they were not necessarily starting as a content platform. Oh. Their, their, their main focus was the expert accuracy rankings. And then they kind of, you know, and they developed tools out from, there. from there. Like, yeah, the draft wizard was game changing. I remember I didn't work for them at the time, but I remember sitting, uh, if, if anybody's ever done it, you've done, you've sat in those mock draft lobbies yeah. and like you're waiting like a half hour for it. Like, you know, it's like going to start so-and-so you, you fill up your draft queue, you put all those players in there and then it gets to the draft. And all of a sudden you see someone take two quarterbacks or two kickers in the first two rounds. And you're like, this mock is trash. Like you basically click out of it and you're like, I just wasted all that time. But when draft wizard came out, it was a new thing because basically any other automated draft room that you went into, it was the same every time. And it was like, you're, you're in the same every time you're like, well, I know who I'm going to get at this pick. I mean, it doesn't really change. Yeah. The draft wizard took all the analysts that we had contributing like rankings and you drafted against different experts at different times. So it was always extremely random. One draft, you might have Michael Thomas going at one seven, one draft, you might have him going at two, two. So it was really random. You could draft against ADP. You could draft against experts Yahoo because all that stuff changes when right. you're drafting on ESPNs or Yahoo's all those things together. And it was a tools site first in terms of like the tools and, and the expert, uh, expert consensus rankings, the ECR. Mm -hmm. And I was actually the first full-time football writer they hired for the content side because they had a bunch of little feature articles that they had people writing. And when they reached out to me, they're like, we're, we're, we're really getting, we want to get further into the content writing side of things. The idea was that I know on your show sheet, you were going to ask me if I had any say so in it. Part of the reason that I joined, uh, they, I wanted they wanted me to help the content side. They wanted me to lead that side and they wanted me to contribute ideas. So doing it full time for the whole year in the off season. And it's like all these ideas I've ever had, all the things that I ever wanted to know about fantasy football, I was able to answer those questions for our readers. So it was like, what is a dynasty draft pick actually worth? You have any idea how much research time I put into this, like to mm -hmm. try and I've gone through like the past 12 years of data to find out exactly what it means, how much those picks are worth deliver it to people. You know, what does a coaching change mean? Offensive coordinator, head coach, both of them. 
and I, and I go through and I, I create these articles because I'm given the time to do it. Um, so they trust me in the fact that I'm delivering content that people want to read. And if the results are there, they'll, they'll continue to let me do that. If not, I'm always open because I'm not really a hot take guy uh, in terms of like the, like me doing a bold, <laughs> a bold predictions article is really tough because I'm such a, I'm, I'm so you're analytical. Practi you're practical. Yeah. Very practical. Yes. It. I'm still a realist at heart, but I, I, I have turned into somewhat of a dreamer in terms of what's, what you're capable of. But as a person, I'm still like, I'm still very direct in that aspect. So, but yeah, the, the team over there, I mean, I don't know if people realize how big fantasy pros is as a team, but I, I work, I think we have 39 full-time members now. Wow. Um, that, that was going to be my next question. I was wondering like the makeup of fantasy pros seems like you work remotely. Yes, I do. I work from home and that's one of the, man, I, I've had some job opportunities where I'd have to leave home and uh, I turn them down because I, I love, I love being able to see, to, I take my three-year-old to preschool now every day. And that's like, that's a highlight, right? Those are things that when you work in an office, you're, you're sometimes not able to do. I love it. I really do. I, I love being able to walk upstairs. Like my dog just lays next to me uh, throughout the day and just being at home. I'm a homebody. Um, sometimes I need to get out more, <laughs> but uh, no, it's a big company. And like the, the team behind me is just, uh, they created this platform and they're allowing me to put my content on it. And then they make it look really pretty. <laughs> That's basically what it comes down to is just uh, everything is very user friendly. And um, even some of the tools we have that people don't know about. There's I, so much on this but, website, which is well, why Nick, I was like, I need to get down to the core of like what their, yeah, their focus was, you know? Like Nick, how many leagues do you play in? Like, do you play in a lot or do you do DFS strictly now? Or uh, I actually rarely ever do DFS. I've cut down my leagues and I know everyone in, in the industry always says like, oh, I need to cut down my leagues. Yes. I actually did a good job this year. I'm in two dynasty leagues and okay. I did three three redraft leagues. So oh, I'm yeah, in five total, which is, which is good, right? It might, oh, sound, awesome. might sound like a lot to some people, but it's really not a dynasty. You don't really have to worry about the waiver wire too often. Redraft uh -huh. is good. I mean, there were previous years, probably year prior to that, year prior to that, I was in more of like six to seven, eight range. And I'm just like, I, I can't do that because on top of when you're in season, it's so hard to get your waiver wire stuff out, get all the stuff out. And then mm -hmm. also like, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night on Tuesday when you're done with your content and then you're like, I got to put in waiver ads, <laughs> 10 leagues. I'm like, I can't do that. You know, it's Dude, ridiculous. I'm hundred percent there with you. Like I, uh, I, I was in 24 at one point and then I, I cut 24? it down. Jesus no, Christ. I, no, I kid you not. And I want to cut it down. It's just, I have a difficulty leaving industry leagues. Cause I feel like I'm developed, I've developed a personal relationship with some of them, but I, I cut, I cut it down to 17. So Tuesday nights are the worst. I, I love that you brought that up. They're the absolute worst because basically worst. I get up early in the morning and I want to spend a couple hours at night. But when I come up, I'm sitting on my phone going through waivers and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I hate these leagues. I legitimately hate doing it. One of the tools that they developed is, is uh, my playbook where even if you forget to set your lineup in one of your leagues, it will automatically set it with inactive. So if someone's, you're, you're, let's say someone's at church or they're out doing something on Sunday, an emergency came up, it'll auto swap those players based on what the experts recommend. And it's oh, wow. uh, the tools, like the, the developers for Fantasy Pros are top notch. And everybody that works the company, we get together every single year. And sometimes at, at different events, like we went to the draft last year to hang out. We all get along and it's... Oh, you it, guys were at the draft in Nashville? Yeah, it was uh, such I was, a I was there too. That was crazy. That yeah, was, it was insane. It was a crazy atmosphere. Like I, I, I'm not going to do a draft, I don't think, again, just because I, I like watching the draft. Not Vegas. That was a party. That was like, Nashville was great. We were on the rooftops and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, great team surrounding me. And it's like, that's... All of us are required to to bring the product, but it was a good question though. In terms of like, you know, what's the the mission? Uh, it's basically to deliver what any fantasy owner wants: content, tools, advice, whatever. I use the Draft Wizard often throughout the summer, I and mean, obviously, I'll check out the the expert rankings. But I, I haven't checked out all the tools that you guys have, and even that tool, in a sense, would definitely be something super valuable to me. Does Fantasy Pros do they have a, a main office, a headquarters? Is it, everyone remote? Everyone is remote. Yep. Um, so the, the company like address and stuff is based in Vegas, but it's not. So we, we're, we're all remote. And uh, it's one of those nice things. We talk every single month. It, it, I've worked at a couple fantasy places like PFF and like mm -hmm. I, I've heard of some other work atmospheres, but we all stay in, t in constant connection. It's not just the content guys either. Like I talk to the devs like almost every single day. They, they ask me input in, in terms of like what we feel like the, the optimizer, how can that be better? What, what are tools that we don't have that we should have? And it really, it, they've built a family. And it's, it's one of those tough things when you run a company, like my dad owned a business, my mom owned a business and hiring people like and, and building a community of people that want the same thing. It can sometimes be difficult. It done a really good job with it. I'm, I'm super proud of our team. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's it's tough to work completely remote. I'm I'm assuming with a team, you know, that large. Even uh, just a few guys, a handful of people that I ha that help me on my team. It's just like uh, it's great, but 
the, <laughs> the energy and the camaraderie of being together brings yeah. a whole nother level of like atmosphere. And that's what we're currently uh, working towards. That's pretty cool to hear because I, I don't think a lot of people realize how big it was. But once you go on the website and just see the, the pure amount of content that you guys are delivering, you know, sport over sport, week over week, day over day, it gives you a good idea of, you know, you have 39 full time people, but I'm sure you have hundreds and hundreds of, yes. of like freelance sure, yeah. writers and yeah. stuff too. So now I think it was something you touched on that they built around the tools that they made. Mm -hmm. And I think this this point right here is imp very important for brands or companies that are trying to break out in the space right now, not just individuals or bloggers or anything. But again, it goes back to the point that no matter how good your product is, you're a marketer first, a company second. You know, you're a marketing company first. You're a media company first, in a sense, that second. Because you look at any company that's doing it really well, no matter how good their tools are, if they're not pumping out ridiculous amounts of volume, they're not getting users to their website. Like Fantasy Pros, you have a crazy amount of content. PFF, mm -hmm. right? Their tools and their stuff are great, but no one would come to them if they didn't have the personal brands of the people that work there and they're not pumping out content left and right, especially people that are more in like the data side of things. Your data is great. I'm sure it's phenomenal and would help a lot of people, but you need to make sure that you're looking at content marketing as probably the most important thing. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to funnel people there. So it's a smart play for fantasy pros knowing that they had the tools, they had the data, but they needed to market well. Content is, is what makes the internet kind of run right now. So yep. if you're a brand out there, and you know, you have good stuff, good products, your next step is, you know, what's funny, I, I think that like, over the next five to 10 years, what we're going to see is that most companies doesn't even matter about the industry are going to start creating uh, content studios within their company. You know, I think that like, even, you know, obviously, we're an industry built on just straight content. But I think you're going to start seeing, I don't know, it could be like a car dealership, it could be uh, any kind of a Home Depot, or whatever, they might start making studios within their companies. Because I yeah. think that's, the, I feel like that's the way the world is going now. I don't know, it'd be a cool place to live in. If, if Oh, yeah. The, the, I mean, there's so many, there's so many things you have to wonder about is when you have that many moving places, like moving pieces, and you try and bring them all together. At that, it does get difficult. But having the, the studio that would be somewhat that would be pretty nice. But where everything's headed? I don't know, man. I, I, I really wish I could answer the question in terms of like where the industry is going and what is going to be the next big thing. Because uh, I know video, you do a great job on YouTube. And a lot of people are trying to build their video. So I think they're behind you in that aspect. But it's, it's tough, because it's just another thing that requires time, right? It's commitment. Yeah. Oh, let me ask you because you had mentioned something before about, you know, some of your friends asked you, like, how do I break into the industry? You said, yep. you know, right every day. Like if someone someone comes to you today, and they're like, Mike, what do you think is the first thing I should do? Like, is that what you would tell them to write every day? I would write and I would do a podcast. Um, because basically, when you start doing a podcast, you're gonna suck. Um, yeah. That's like, like, seriously, uh, I remember I recorded my own for my own website, I recorded my own podcast. And I thought I did so good, because I had my projections up. And I, I talked through every player from I did one podcast per team breaking down everybody on the roster. And uh, I went back and I listened to it. And I was like, Oh my God. Like I was monotone. I was so boring. It's one of those things where you, you need to do that stuff to get it out of your system. Because when you eventually want, you want to interview or you want to go on a, a podcast, you want to sound better. So it's like, even record yourself. You don't have to put it out anywhere if you don't want to but record yourself on video, record yourself on a microphone and, and listen back to it and critique yourself. Like you are your own worst critic. That's, that's a real thing. You know, you're going to hate your voice at the beginning. It's going to happen, but then you're going to find it and you're going to uh, eventually get better at it. But the, the more you write, the more you record, the better you're going to get. But in the end, if you want to do YouTube stuff, if you want to stream, be consistent. Um, I cannot, I cannot, stress this enough in terms of people wanting to do a stream schedule and they're like oh hey guys i had something come up i'm not gonna stream today but i'll stream tomorrow and it's nope. like no 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 no. your audience they expect you to be there it's you like don't, watching yeah, you a don't TV get show. that you don't get that leverage when you're especially yep. not when you're starting out i mean even at, at the scale that you're at you probably yep. feel terrible missing one thing that you had on yep. your schedule right yep yeah absolutely it's like there is so much out there because every time that you're not there that means someone else is going to be there for them Fact. and you don't want that to be the case so it's it's almost like you know you talked about getting that content out there and continually putting up stuff there you want your face everywhere you want your voice everywhere but at the same time you don't want to forego what got you there in the first place which is the the research you know that's the stuff that personalities are a big thing and some people will tell you that you have to have a big personality uh i'm not going to say it, it, it hurts uh, to have a personality but uh, make sure your content is good. That will help. And then your, your personality will develop as the years go on.
Yeah. And the reason I asked you this, and I had a feeling that you would start off with the whole writing thing. And I, I asked some of the people that are more experienced in the industry that are a little older than me. And usually their answer does come back with the like, you know, write every day. And from where I sit, that would be the last thing I tell people to do. Because again, I look at it from a marketing standpoint first. Yep. And the hardest thing to break in through, through our industry is just straight writing. It's just, you, you know, you, you'll never ever rank on top of Google. Your blogs are one out of a million blogs being done. Yep. But podcasting and video are where I would see you would have to separate yourself because that's the wave right now. What I would say, my suggestion would be anyone starting, I think doing something similar to what I, I think using long form video as the foundation of your content is huge. It doesn't have to be on YouTube. It could be on whatever video platform it does. But what long form content does, I would do exactly something like I have. I don't know if the, in terms of the aesthetics and the setups, you could do whatever you want. If you have a long form video, what you could do. As soon as you're done, you could edit it, whatever. You download it, you could strip the audio, upload that right to podcasting. You could take the video and chop it into two minute clips. And there you go. You could put it on Instagram, you could put it on Twitter, you could put it on LinkedIn. You, you know, that's the reason I say that when you're starting off, especially, and you're trying to be, you know, th there could be a lot of noise. Like you need to be on this platform, you need to be on that platform. And you, and you mentioned Joe Holka, and I'm, I'm pretty good friends with Joe Holka. We talk very often about the same subject because me and him see things very similarly. He does a great job of being everywhere. And I mean, that's, that's not by mistake, right? He's starting to streamline and automate his processes and he's getting better and better. And I'm, you know, I'm watching him do it. So it's cool to see how efficient he's been in that sense. Obviously, you're going to make mistakes when you start. Yep. But when we live in a world where you do have to be everywhere, the best way to do that is by making it easy for yourself and automate the things. So if I had to give out a tip, like, yes, writing could be good if you're passionate about that and you want to write, but don't write just for the sake of writing because you think that's how you break free. Because, you know, anyone who's followed Mike might be like, I want to do what Mike does. So I'm going to write every day. But the amount of time it took Mike to get there, the five yeah. years, the seven years, whatever, by the time you put that work in, like writing will be a thing of the past. If there's a kid out there right now that wants to be a YouTuber and you're going to put in the five years that I've already put in to get to where I'm at, YouTube's going to be way too saturated. So you, you can never get to the thing you want to get to by doing what it took to get there. You know what I mean? Like you'll have to create your own path in a sense that's yeah. down the unbeaten road. That's a really good point because uh, we just hired uh, Kyle Yates. Um, he was someone that... He's from the um, fantasy footballers? He was with the footballers last year, yeah. Uh, we hired him to a full-time role. He just started actually a couple weeks ago. I was talking with him because uh, we got together. We were in Universal Studios. Him and I were just walking around talking about like his journey to get where he got. And, uh, and it's weird because like during the interview process, I remember they were, they were asking our opinion on some of the people that were being interviewed. And it's like, you know, we think he's a good writer, but he's not really great on the media side. We think he's, he's, he's got room for growth on the media side, but he's a really good writer. And so it really depends on the company and what you're, what you're going to apply for, right? Because certain companies like, like us, we're trying to build up our YouTube channel. We didn't have like any YouTube content for a long time. Now we're recording our podcast and putting it up there every day. Now we're doing some, some like top 10 videos and we're doing these and they're going to start pulling things from our podcast to putting that's in how, clips like, like you're saying. It. It, it, it's, yeah. it's brilliant if you want because it allows you to put down so much more content and reach a lot more people. You might grab them with that two minute clip and then they're going to come back and watch the whole thing. So, I mean, I, I kind of agree with you in terms of like media is where everything's kind of trending towards. Like kids don't, and I speak in this because I have a kid that's, you know, that age of like the consumer that we're talking about is they don't have the attention span to sit down and read articles like they used to. Uh, I can't even, I can't read anymore, man. I can't like consume content that way. Obviously. Yeah. I mean, I know how to read, but at this point it's almost like, do I though? Because I can't, I, I try to, I try to read books and I literally, I lose any sort of attention. I consume strictly via podcast. I, you know, yeah. it might be surprising, but I don't watch YouTube videos. I don't watch people that even on fantasy, whatever. Yep. I watch YouTube videos if I need to figure out like a how to thing, but I'm strictly podcast. I listen to it all day. So it's like, you need to find a way to, <laughs> infiltrate you know where people are and that's the way things are moving so like you said yeah i mean if you want to do a podcast that's cool too. figure out the way that you best deliver the value that you're going to give to the eyeballs or the you know the ears whatever just make sure you're recording it right there's just an easy way to streamline or automate a lot of things by just making one simple hack or one extra piece of technology that you could just throw in there don't even know that you're videotaping it but if you do it they'll be happy because you could put it in a lot of different places. No, that, that's a really good point. I, it's, it's weird because like we're, we're from, it's almost like a different era and not understanding, but I, but I know my daughter sits on the couch and she watches these TikTok things. And I, I don't get it. 
I, I really, I, I'll, I'll be honest about it. I do not get it. I don't understand. Like, it's like you have to grab someone in 15 seconds. That's not what I do. Mine's, mine, mine has always been long form. And uh, this is something I need to adapt to because obviously times are changing and mm -hmm. uh, I need people to read the articles. So, um, <laughs> so go read Mike's podcast. articles, please. They'll be linked in the description. Yeah. But, but in reality, the podcast has done so well too. It's turned into a bigger thing than I think that anybody at Fantasy Pros thought it was going to be. Um, yep. So we definitely appreciate the support there. I love doing it all. And I, like I said, podcasts are my favorite because I, I believe that it forces people to think off script. Like writing, anybody can put together an article. They can spend all the time. They can do researching it and this and that if you have the time to do it. Uh, but podcasts, I love them because it just, it allows your personality to shine. People can actually hear what you're saying in the context that you're saying it. You can't fake uh, yeah. it. That's why I hate, not, not that I hate writing. That's why I, it's my least preferred thing to do in terms of yeah. like a creative outlet because there's so much law. I, I think like the context of the way you deliver things is way more important than what you actually deliver. Like if you can't deliver it with confidence, you know, yes. I think like micro expressions are extremely underrated part of like delivering mm -hmm. content as well. The way you move different parts of your body and your hand motions and things like that. And, and the tone of your voice is just so important that yes. when that gets left out, it's almost like, like yep. you don't even know the person. Like I, if I read a blog post that's fantasy football related now, like if I, if I'm reading your primer, I'll know it's yours. If I'm reading Evan Silva's matchup column, I'll know it's his. Right. But if, I, if I'm on Twitter and I just scroll down, I see a, a subject for a topic. I'm like, Oh, that looks interesting. I'll click on it. I will have no idea who the author was by the end of it. Right. And I probably no offense to whoever writes it, but I don't care. You know what I mean? Right. Because it, it, there's no connection there other than what you're writing. And it's so procured that by the time, you know, it's done and it's actually published, it's not really your words anymore. You know, like you've yep. taken a, a side of you, you wouldn't speak that way. A lot of the time, the way you write are, is really nice, big vocab, but you would never speak that way in person. That's why I like mm -hmm. podcasting. That's why I love video because I think it connects with the audience on a level that could just never really be done via blogging. And, and again, I think everything in today's world goes back to building that personal brand and building the depth of the connection with the audience. So blogging, cool. If it's a passion of yours, do it, but don't do it because you think that's how you have to do it in in the fantasy football industry. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point, man. So um, I, I think we've probably covered most of what Mike's got going on. Fantasy pros has, has come up uh, a, a lot of good value given out there. We're going to end this with uh, a few random questions that I like to throw out there. Now I know you're obviously passionate about writing, um, but yeah. you did not come from like journalism school or anything like that. You were in the banking industry. So do you have any other like creative endeavors that you might want to tackle, whether it's, you know, short term or very long term maybe you'll hang up the fantasy stuff in in five years and then after that you're going to go you know write an write an actual novel or maybe you want to go be a sculptor or something like that is there <laughs> anything on your mind that way yes writing an actual novel is uh something i i started and i started it two years ago um i'm thirty thousand words into it which is really weird because people are like you write that every single week <laughs> um writing a novel is like a, an out-of-body experience and one that it's, uh, it's something I'm re I really do enjoy. It's just I have to let myself get into it because I actually met with a New York Times bestseller and she was telling me that uh, she's like, write every day. She's like, because I'm like, how do you not lose connection to your characters, right? And she's like, well, write every day, blah, blah. And I'm like, I just don't, I, I can't do it because ba the, the way that I've, I've, I've kind of allowed myself to write this book, it's a, it's a fiction novel, but it's one that's helping me get better as a person. Uh, one of the things I struggle with as a person is uh, understanding what some other people are going through in times like where it's like if you're walking through a mall and someone like, like their shoulder just jams right into you and they're running past you. They don't stop and say, sorry. Um, they run out the door. They don't hold the door for you. They, they do drive on the shoulder. Uh, and I'm like, what the hell is wrong with you? You know, like, th <laughs> yeah. like that's how I feel in those times where I've, I need to be better uh, in terms of like understanding what people are going through. And sometimes it may affect, you know, some of the decisions they make. So mm -hmm. this novel I'm writing, I'm almost forcing myself out of my comfort zone into a tragedy that kind of opens up getting into those characters minds. Like I'll take my, like during the summer when I'm writing it, I'll take my son for a walk and I'm starting to envision the character and it's like, how is he feeling in this moment? And there was like a part a book that came up and it like literally made me tear up on my walk. And like, I think that's what you need to do when you're writing a novel is that you need to be into it. And that's why I cannot write it throughout the year because I'm not invested in it. Like I'm not, I can't get into those characters where once May comes around, I'm really like, I talked to my wife about it. And again, she's supportive in anything that I have a passion about. And she says that it's one of those things that she admires about me is that when I have a passion about something, like I, I'm so passionate about it. I, I think I'm going to try and like go to like a cabin with like no internet and just write for a week and try and knock this book out because it's been stewing up inside me. Like I know what's supposed to happen. I know how it's going to happen. It's just a matter of sitting down and actually delivering it and, and capturing that emotion throughout the novel. So she's like, well, you tell me when you need to do it and we'll make it work. The part that sucks 
is that I take myself away from family so much in season where it's like, mm -hmm. this, that's the time where I'm supposed to be spending with them. But it's, it's, it's a goal of mine to get a novel out there and hopefully get published and, um, you know, a book deal or whatever like that. If, is that a real thing? Maybe. Well, here's the, here's the cool thing is like when you've built an audience, you give yourself leverage that you don't, you know, you don't have to take the, the, the typical route of an author who has no, no clout right now, you know, like you could put that out to your audience and I'm sure you'd get a good amount of sales or an, enough to, you know, satisfy a, a publisher or whatever. So you, you do have some, some good leverage there. Yeah. And I, I think about that and I'm like, I need to capture that. And you know, the audience keeps growing and that's great. And I know they follow me for football, but some people tell me that they're like, it's great that you're branching out. I would read it because of the way you are as a writer. And I really do hope that I capture that. I, it's just one of those goals. That, but the, the other thing I worry about though, is like when people talk about book deals and like, once your book comes out, it's like, are you going to sign a book deal? And I'm like, well, th we're getting ahead of ourselves. But if I really do want something, I know that I'll push myself and I'll keep working towards it. But I don't like the idea that people are authors are required to do a certain amount of books per year on a book contract or that's the part that sucks because I feel like it's not organic you're not just letting the story happen as it's supposed to um I mean you could self-publish no you can but that's the thing is like the idea is that you get someone else to do that marketing for you and you get to okay. do all those things where it, it reaches the masses and that's the idea because I think in the end this this novel that I'm writing it has mass appeal it's just a matter of is will it be marketed correctly and um how will it be received and can I capture that um, some people might say it's rough around the edges because it's my first novel, but I believe that's when authors are the most raw is because there are no expectations. There is right. nobody waiting on a book for me. And it's like, I can take my time and do it the way I want to. That's a good point. Yeah. I'm sure. I mean, people that publish the books for you, I've never like talked to people that work in those kind of businesses or anything, yeah. but I'm sure someone coming in with, you know, the work that you've already shown that you can do and the audience that you've built, they'd be ecstatic about having that rather than another author who has never really shown that they could build an audience and provide value through any sense of social media or whatever it is. So I, I bet you could probably, you know, negotiate your way into a deal that, that you would like that wouldn't take too much leverage off your plate. So that, that's interesting. A lot of people uh, in the fantasy industry answer this question the same way and that they would write a book. So we've got a lot of writers here. I'm going to have a lot of reading lists to, to knock down <laughs> when, when everybody uh, gets their books out there, which is unfortunate because I don't know how to read anymore. But I will, read you, I will read you the last question. The audio book? <laughs> we, could, we could do the audio book. We could there do it go. as a podcast. All right. Best purchase that you've made under $100? This is such a good question, by the way. Again, um, I, I want to reiterate that I stole this from Tools of Titans from Tim Ferriss. Great book. I don't even care where you stole it from. It's an awesome question. Right? And uh, it's, <laughs> I've told someone this before. I'm going to stick to it. Um, the hockey puck shower radio thing that I have. It's like, it was like 35 bucks or something like that because I was always the kid. Like I'm a music junkie. I love music. Like I listened to people saw, I was just, I was actually able because of the primer, I was able to actually get backstage and meet my favorite band of all time corn. Um, I was awesome. able to meet those guys, talk with them because of the primer, because someone that reads it is connected. And I can't thank you guys enough for, for like connecting with people like that. And I'm a music junkie. I've always been, I took my wife to see Richard Marks actually on Sunday night. That was such a great show. It was an acoustic show. But I always listen to music no matter what. And so when I'm in the shower, I always brought a radio when I was a kid and just like set the radio on the bathroom sink or whatever and play my CDs. Or, but now it's gotten to the point where it's like I'll put on something and I don't want to listen to that song. But the radio puck in the shower, I could press next. I could answer a call. I could do whatever I want in the shower with music. And it's glorious. Yeah, I have a, uh, I have a Bluetooth speaker. I call it the boomstick that I, keep, I take in the shower with me too. Mm -hmm. but, but I guess I need to upgrade because mine – if I get a call in the middle of it, it goes off and then it cuts anything out. Like it, the call ends and then it's just silent afterwards. Oh, just like, damn, that sucks. There's, there's no button for it, but it's really, really good prior to that. So yes, I would highly suggest everyone investing into some type of waterproof speaker for the shower. I listen to yes. podcasts in the shower. Mike, I've probably listened to your voice in the shower before. I'll, I'll <laughs> Sexy time. That right now. <laughs> Let's go. All right. So uh, that's going to wrap up our discussion for today. Make sure that if you guys uh, found this valuable, you got some good information from it. Hopefully it was uh, motivating or inspirational to some of you guys. We just ask that you share it with people that also might find it valuable. Um, you can hit that thumbs up down below to let us know that you enjoyed and we'll keep pushing these out for you. Of course, go follow Mike and all his work on Twitter and I will link all of his social media down below as well as the boys over at Fantasy Pros. Mike, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me and have a fantastic Valentine's Day weekend. And say hi to uh, Mrs. Tags for me. I know she has no idea who I am, but <laughs> sounds like an incredible woman. So She is. And thank you very much. Appreciate, uh, appreciate having me on. Happy Valentine's Day. And um, yeah, if you guys have any questions in regards to anything leading up in the industry or any follow-up questions to this, just let me know on Twitter. And I will. this is the time of the year where I can actually respond to a lot of them. All right. Later, boys and girls. <laughs>